This is purely a journalistic point of view. Nothing more has been said in this video other than that of which has been reported by various media sources and backed up with sources seen at the end of this video. On the 9th November 1997, the WWF held its annual Survivor Series pay-per-view, main evented by a title match between Shawn Michaels and WWF Champion Bret Hart. Hart, who had worked in the WWF since 1984, was now leaving for the WWF's arch-rival WCW in less than a month. What was supposed to be a disqualification win for Bret Hart turned into a nightmare as he was bamboozled out of the WWF Championship. Or was he? Join us now for Behind the Titantron, the Montreal Screwjob Part 3 Bret Hart and Vince McMahon had reached an impasse about Hart dropping the WWF Championship to Shawn Michaels at Survivor Series in Montreal, Canada. Bret was adamant about refusing to lay down for Michaels, especially after Michaels insulted him in the locker room when he told Hart he wouldn't lose to him. With Bret Hart having reasonable creative control for his last month in the WWF, there were limits to how the WWF could take the belt off him. While McMahon was insisting Hart drop the WWF Championship before the 10th November 1997, the day Eric Bischoff had promised Hart he wouldn't announce his signing until Monday Night Nitro on that date, Brett remarked in the documentary Hitman Hart Wrestling with Shadows that he'd worked over 300 dates in 1997, considerably more than 275 dates required by contract. If so, Hart was under no obligation to show up for Survivor Series. This seemed unlikely though, as Hart's commitment to the WWF has always been solid. In his 14 years working for the company, he'd claimed he'd only missed two dates. McMahon seemed confident that Hart wouldn't betray him by showing up on Nitro with the WWF Championship, but he was also confident WCW's Eric Bischoff would do whatever he could to capitalize on Hart's signing. In an interview with Kayfabe Commentaries, Jim Cornette said Vince McMahon didn't trust Eric Bischoff after the Medusa incident. He said Vince put himself in a bad position when he kept the belt on Hart before he made his decision to go to WCW. When McMahon told Cornette, Hart had suggested handing the WWF Championship to him on Raw. Cornette told him, why don't you lay down in the ring and let him p*** in your mouth. In a shoot interview, Eric Bischoff recalls there was no way they would pull a stunt like that with Bret because WCW was buried in litigation following Kevin Nash and Scott Hall's jump to WCW. The WWF had sued WCW, alleging they were using Nash and Hall's Diesel and Razor Ramon characters, implying they still worked for the WWF. In the interview, Bischoff said he couldn't have recreated the Alundra Blaze angle even if he wanted to. Whether or not Bischoff's remarks are true, Vince McMahon was growing more concerned, leading him to consider options he might not have considered before, such as a double cross. Although the moment when Vince decided on a shoot are unknown, we do know this. Things were looking grim when Jim Cornette jokingly suggested McMahon put Ken Shamrock in the ring with Brett and pull a shoot. Cornette said McMahon's options suddenly changed. According to the book Titan Screwed, it's arguable the seed had been planted in McMahon's mind and he was looking for someone else to suggest what he was now considering himself. McMahon then met with Shawn Michaels and Hunter Hearst Helmsley to discuss Michaels' match. McMahon implied he was having problems getting the belt off Hart when Helmsley chimed in. Michaels recalls in his autobiography Heartbreak and Triumph how he and Hunter spoke on the phone weekly with McMahon to discuss creative ideas. McMahon told of Hart's refusal to drop the belt in Canada, explaining his hands were tied due to Hart's creative control. It was at this point Hunter Hearst Helmsley reportedly said, I know I'm not supposed to be talking here. Maybe I'm out of line, but what kind of business is this? Who in the world says, I don't want to drop the belt? You helped him get a better deal there and he is leaving. That isn't right. That is BS. How in the world can you trust him? This is the same guy who, while he was off, after dropping the title to Sean, went behind your back and negotiated a deal with WCW only to come back and renegotiate a 20-year way out of bounds contract with you. He has not done good business since. And now he is leaving to get even more money by you giving them the impression that you wanted to keep him. Helmsley's tirade may have been the impetus McMahon was looking for to suggest a double cross. When McMahon restated his hands were tied, Michael said, I'll do whatever you want. I'll just swerve him or whatever I have to do. You tell me what needs to get done. You and this company have put up with so much from me. My loyalty is here with you. I will do whatever you want. Michael's reply led to McMahon reportedly saying, 
That's pretty serious. That has to be a last resort. I still have until Saturday to talk to Brett. That may have to be a real option. This cannot be discussed with anyone. Pat can't know, nobody can know about this, but the three of us right now. It's something we will have to talk about. By Saturday night, it was clear to Vince McMahon that Bret Hart wasn't going to drop the WWF Championship the next night at Survivor Series. McMahon met behind closed doors with Hunter, Michaels and Gerald Briscoe. McMahon announced his decision to proceed with the double cross and told all three men no one else was to know about the coming action. While speculation has ran rampant that Pat Patterson or Jim Ross knew, Numerous parties have stated McMahon kept them out of the loop as Patterson, the head booker at the time, and Ross, in charge of talent relations, were too close to the boys for them to be tainted by such a scandal. It's likely nobody would have trusted them after this. While Bret Hart was wary going into the match, he felt more confident when he talked with referee Earl Hebner to discuss his concerns about a double cross. Hebner promised Hart there was no possibility he'd betray him, swearing to God on his children's lives. Once Hart saw Hebner was refereeing the match, he was confident he couldn't get out of any possible swerve. Unbeknownst to the hitman, Hebner was confronted by the WWS Gerald Briscoe on his way to the ring and told to call the bell when Michaels put Hart in the sharpshooter. Briscoe warned Hebner he was microphoned and any attempt to alert Hart would lead to his firing. Hart has been asked many times whether he suspected any treachery. He writes in his autobiography, People still ask me, didn't you see it coming? The truth was, I'd been reasonable in every way. And with Earl watching my back, I thought I had nothing to worry about. Ninth November 1997 saw Bret Hart meet with Vince McMahon to discuss Hart's upcoming match and Hart and McMahon's long relationship. Unknown to McMahon, Hart was wearing a hidden microphone. So the conversation was recorded. McMahon and Hart went back and forth on the finish for Hart's match. Hart suggesting he retain the WWF Championship, but forfeit it the next night on Raw. McMahon told Hart the match would end in disqualification when DX interfered in the match. However, McMahon had something else planned for the hitman. Hart met with Sean before the match to have a final heart to heart. Michaels remembers Hart and him talking about putting things in the past and how Hart explained his reasoning for not wanting to drop the title. To Michaels, Hart's need to keep the title in Canada defied the understanding the business is a work. In his autobiography, Michaels recalls, I was thinking, you take yourself pretty seriously, don't you? He's dropping a title but it's the same title someone else let him win. I know the first time you win it, it's real, but it always remained real for him. It was just a conversation that I couldn't believe I was having with a guy who had been in the business for 20 years and was 40 plus years old. Despite Hart's refusal to drop the belt, Michaels claims he felt terrible when Hart asked him if he could trust him and he replied yes. According to Michaels, despite all our problems, I really felt bad for him because I knew this was the end and he had no idea what was coming. When Shawn Michaels went to the ring, he noticed a congregation near the gorilla position. In his autobiography, Michaels noted, Hunter was there, so was Briscoe. Vince started drifting to us and Pat was there as well. Then Davy Boy and Owen Hart came up next to us. The finish, as far as everyone else knew, was that Hunter was going to come down and interfere. And then those guys would come down and there would be a big fight and a DQ. But when the guys are going to do a run-in, they don't stand at Gorilla before the match starts. It was very unusual for them to be there. I was thinking they were there in case something happens. Vince McMahon's sudden appearance at ringside wasn't out of the ordinary as he'd been involved in a storyline with building tension between him and Brett. For storyline purpose, McMahon was there to try and get the match under control as Michaels and Hart battled in and out of the ring, including the crowd. The reality was McMahon's true purpose was to make sure that the bell was rung before Hart had a chance to stop Michaels during the double cross. In his autobiography, Brett remembers Sean applying the shop shooter but not getting it in right. He then corrected Sean unaware he was pulling the trigger on the double cross. Moments later, Earl Hebner motioned for the bell to be rung. As Michael's music played, Hart realized he had been double crossed. Hart held on to Michael's at first, but then got up, spitting in Vince McMahon's face. Hart recalls his anger and emotion, looking out at a stunned crowd. I fought the tears that were swimming in my eyes and thought, don't you dare give these backstabbers the satisfaction of seeing you cry over any of this. Hart pantomimed the letters for WCW. While word was already out he was jumping ship to WCW, Hart wanted as many people to know as possible. Triple H shuttled Shawn Michaels out of the ring. As Bret Hart remembers, the fans looked close to a riot. The thought of fans attacking them had to be running through Sean and Hunter's mind. What was going to happen backstage though? The backstage was in chaos as wrestlers tried to piece together what had just happened. 
Bret Hart went to find Vince McMahon, but McMahon was locked in his office. Hart went to the dressing room where he recalls, walking inside only to see Sean sitting in the corner. Sean, you weren't in on that? I swear to f God, I had nothing to do with it. With the wrestling with Shadow's crew still filming everything, Hart debated whether or not to attack Michaels. I wanted to rip Sean to shreds deep down. I knew he was in on it all the way, but I didn't want to lose my cool in front of Blade. Hart warned Michaels he'd judge him by what he did the next night on Raw. In the meantime, The Undertaker reportedly stormed up to Vince McMahon's office and demanded that McMahon face Bret Hart. As the WWS locker room leader, it's likely The Undertaker understood an explanation was due, not only to Hart, but to the boys in general. Multiple sources state that The Undertaker went to McMahon and told him he owed Hart an apology. Hart apparently had to change his mind when McMahon and his entourage showed up. Hart warned McMahon to leave or get hit. However, McMahon refused to leave. Hart says McMahon's group tried to clear out the dressing room, but Davy Boy Smith told Owen to stay, reminding him of what happened to Bruiser Brody when promoter Jose Gonzalez allegedly stabbed him to death in the dressing room showers. According to Hart, McMahon told him, It's the first time I ever had to lie to one of my talent, but Hart wasn't buying it. Hart claims he replied, Who are you kidding, you lying piece of shit? Hart warned McMahon to leave the dressing room, but Hart states they continued arguing, with McMahon claiming he'd help Hart get to his WCW deal and Hart reminding McMahon he wanted to stay in the WWF even if it meant less money. The war of words escalated and Hart knew things were going to escalate to physicality, even if it would be short-lived with everyone standing nearby waiting to break things up. Hart recounts, I picked up my knee brace, thinking to smash Vince over the head with it, but I tossed it down, declaring, I won't need this and went straight for him. Cockily, Vince came back at me and we actually tied up. 14 f***ing years. I launched a rocket launcher uppercut that connected with Vince's jaw. My right fist actually popped him like a cork off the ground and he collapsed unconscious to the carpet. Like many of the accounts here, there are conflicting reports of what happened. Shawn Michaels claims McMahon let Hart strike him, suggesting he even took a dive. In subsequent interviews, McMahon would claim he had given Hart a free shot. While there's no conclusive proof of whether Vince took the punch or McMahon made the mistake of stepping to Hart, the footage from Wrestling With Shadows shows a dazed Vince McMahon walking out of the dressing room. The WWF Championship was off Bret Hart and Hart was on his way to WCW. The fallout from the Montreal Screwjob saw the birth of the Mr. McMahon character, one of the key moments in the Monday Night War. Eventually, Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels and Vince McMahon reconciled over the Montreal Screwjob after years of guilt and bitterness. 20 years later, the Montreal Screwjob remains of one of wrestling's most controversial incidents. Fans still argue whether the events of the 9th November 1997 were an underhanded power play against Hart or an elaborately worked scheme to draw controversy for both the WWF and Bret Hart on his way out of the company. Despite wrestlers and others alleging the Montreal Screwjob wasn't a double cross but an angle, it's difficult to conceive of someone keeping a secret of this magnitude for 20 years. With wrestlers and backstage personnel coming and going in the WWE, it defies the odds that someone wouldn't have presented evidence that the Montreal Screwjob was an elaborate work by Vince McMahon, Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart. Thus far, that hasn't happened. It's even arguable Vince McMahon, known for his large ego, would want to take credit for it. The question seems to come down to one of whether something is possible or probable. Could the Montreal Screwjob been possible? Of course. Does the evidence support it being probable? That is something that we will leave you to decide. Let us know in the comments below guys. I hope you've enjoyed this three-parter to Behind the Titan Tron. We would be grateful if you could check out our Patreon to support us and the channel. Subscribe if you haven't already. And I'll see you next time with some more wrestling content.